Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Fall 2019 Honors Lecture Series on Suffrage. My name is Dr. Philip Phillips, and I'm the Associate Dean of the University Honors College. Uh, as always, I'm pleased to have so many people here, uh, not only members of this cl class, but also faculty and staff and uh, visitors uh, from, from the public. Uh, for those of you uh, coming to this for the first time, I would like to say that the Honors Lecture Series is not only a class that's required of students to graduate from the University Honors College at MTSU, but it's also an event that is free and open to the public. And uh, we've been very fortunate this semester to have such a, such a wonderful lineup of speakers. So at this time, I would like to welcome Dr. Mary Evans to introduce our speaker. Dr. Evans is a research associate professor of history, one of our resident faculty members, and the head of our American Democracy Project on our campus. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so pleased to introduce to you today um, my colleague, Dr. Carol Stanford Busey. Dr. Busey is Professor of History at Volunteer State Community College, and she also holds an appointment currently as the Davidson County Historian. She's the primary consulting historian for the new Suffrage Room that will open um, this winter, probably February of 2020, on the second floor of the Nashville Public Library, the downtown public library um, that already houses the Civil Rights Room that many of you have been to. So the brand new suffrage room is gonna be a welcome addition and it's due to open very soon. Dr. Busey has degrees in history from Baylor University and George Peabody College and her PhD is in history from Vanderbilt University. She's the author of many scholarly articles as well as social studies textbooks and she's a longtime advocate for state and local hist history. She regularly conducts teacher workshops on um, the incorporation of Tennessee history into existing US history courses and she's a frequent speaker across Davidson County and Middle Tennessee, and really on a variety of subjects that have to do with state and local history, as well as women's history, which is why she's here with us today. She's spoken in Magdeburg, Germany, with a Nashville Sister Cities delegation on Nashville history. And um, at the 50th anniversary of the 1977 International Women's Year Conference, one of the major events um, back in the late 20th century that hallmarked women's political activism across the United States. She gave a paper in 2017 at the University of Houston conference about that, talking about Tennessee and the Equal Rights Amendment. Next month, she'll be a panelist also at the Tennessee State Museum at the premiere of another documentary, we were referring to one only minutes ago, uh, that Nashville Public Television is doing. This brand new documentary is on, called By One Vote, and it is the story about which um, Dr. Busey will be talking to us today. She's one of the featured women interviewed uh, in the documentary, as well as was Dr. Marjorie Spruill, whom you all got to see on Constitution Day when she spoke with us here um, at Tucker Theater back on September 17th. Um, that new documentary will be broadcast on Nashville Public Television beginning on Thursday, November 21st at 8 p.m. That's Channel 8. Please mark your calendars. Uh, for those of you in this class, you would be wise to watch it. Dr. Busey has, spent paper, has um, presented papers on the works of Tennessee, the, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, my letters were jumbling in my head, and she has a paper in development on that and another paper in development on the ratification and then the rescission of the Equal Rights Am Amendment here in Tennessee. As I said, Dr. Busey teaches Tennessee history and women's history. Those are a perfect combination for us, and she's here today to, for us to review the story of woman suffrage and the 19th Amendment in Tennessee, Tennessee as the perfect 36th state to ratify the amendment that gave the, the vote to women. Dr. Carol Busey. It's a pleasure to be down here at MTSU today and to talk about a subject that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, as Dr. Evans said, I graduated from Baylor University and I majored in history there 
and there was no women's history course at Baylor University back when I was in school there at all. Uh, indeed, there were very few mentions of women in the history books because uh, women just weren't part of the story of United States history or for that matter world history either. You know, in a typical high school book in the early 1970s, you would see um, a few women. You would see Clara Barton wringing the blood out of her skirt. You might see Betsy Ross doing something appropriately womanly, uh, making a flag, whether it existed or not. Uh, you might see women doing things like rolling bandages for World War I or World War II, but that was it. There was no mention of Seneca Falls in my college survey textbooks. There was certain no mention of Tennessee's very important role in the ratification of the suffrage amendment that gave women the right to vote. And I thought this was rather curious, but I really didn't ask any questions because I know that the professors would say, well, there's just not enough there for us to have a course on it. And you know, it's kind of like asking my mother and my grandmother, these two very strong women that I grew up in the household with, uh, uh, questions about things that were going on in Texas, they'd just say, well, that's just always the way it's been. That's just the way it is. And uh, th that was the signal for quit asking questions. And so, you know, I never really thought about this much. But one thing we did, we did have, uh, when I was growing up, a real sense of the rituals associated with the seasons. You know, there were certain things you did when spring arrived. You, you took your mattresses off the bed, you aired them out, you changed your rugs, you changed your curtains, you did all of these seasonal things. And there were some things, some rituals associated with the, the coming of Easter or Mother's Day uh, or birthdays of members of our family that were deceased. You went to the cemeteries and you paid your respects. So I grew up going to a little cemetery in Honey Grove, Texas quite regularly because my great-grandparents were buried there and then eventually my grandparents uh, were buried there and then eventually my own parents were buried there. My mother and father were buried in this cemetery. And this is a cemetery in Nashville that I got very well acquainted with sort of by accident. You know, I came here to graduate school. I had never lived anywhere except Texas. And I came here and really didn't learn much about Tennessee history. It was all focused on the world, and it might be Southern history, but it wasn't Tennessee history. It was the, the, the Civil War was from the Deep South perspective or the Virginia's perspective. So, you know, I just assumed that Tennessee just didn't really have much history and went on about my business. So imagine I'm driving a field trip for my fourth grade son and we went out to the city cemetery and I was totally intrigued by the stories that the woman who was our guide was delivering. She was telling us all these stories about these women who had been buried out there and frankly I found them a whole lot more interesting than those dead Civil War generals. And so I was intrigued by this place and then I started doing a little research. 50 to 75 percent of the bodies buried in this cemetery, which was primarily used before the Civil War, 50 to 75 percent are women and children. Now, you know, the reason women were out there because, was because women had very little, if any, control over their own bodies. And so you basically were pregnant or breastfeeding a baby your entire adult life. And, you know, on the 13th pregnancy, you know, things happen. And so a lot of women died in childbirth. One of the most famous Civil War general's wife um, had died in childbirth, giving birth to her 13th child. She was 37 years old, buried in this cemetery. And I was intrigued by all of these stories. So one thing led to another. And then long about 1990, I heard a woman give a radio musical presentation live down at the Hermitage Hotel. 
it was a little drama that she had done for Michigan Public Radio uh, called The Perfect 36. And she was in Nashville now. She was trying to make it in the music world in Nashville, as people are still trying to do. And she had done this a few years earlier for this Michigan radio station. And it was really the story of Tennessee's ratification of the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. So I'd never heard this story, and a Vanderbilt professor who had kind of befriended me, uh, Elizabeth Perry, Dr. Elizabeth Perry, had kind of taken me under her wing, and she, she had, was the one who had taken me down to hear this. So then I started wondering why I had never heard this story before. And one thing led to another, and I've been retelling this story ever since. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with what women's lives were before 1920, but I think it is good to have a little tiny bit of a refresher and remember that women had no rights. They were in the private sphere. Women, there were many things women were not supposed to do, and they were confined to this sphere. Married women had no rights. A married woman in Tennessee could not even own her own property. Now, this was one of the things that the Seneca Falls Convention was about in 1848. Not about Tennessee women. There were no Tennessee women there, I can assure you. But one of the things on the list was that married women didn't have the right to own their own property. In other words, you inherit money or land from your father and uh, it immediately it belongs to your husband. Women had no custody of their children. Women could not file for divorce. Uh, women had no rights. And so women were confined to this fear, and by and large, they didn't challenge it too much. Uh, but the Seneca Falls Convention, they were really talking about women's property rights and a whole lot of other things, the anti-slavery movement, uh, treatment of women uh, as another one, a case in point. So just take a guess, students. Just take a guess. It wasn't Tennessee. What state in the United States, what liberal state gave married women the right to own property first? That sounds good. No, sorry, New York. That's, that's one of those progressive states we like to think, right? Anybody else care to take a guess? Well, you're close. Next door, Mississippi. Now, you know, we always here in Tennessee, we love to make fun of Mississippi uh, because we, we just do uh, put, make, put Mississippi at the bottom of the pile. So why would Mississippi, of all states, been the only, the first state to let married people own their own property? What do you think? Big Daddy has only girls, and number one daughter is his most precious, precious. And she's marrying, he's marrying her off to this guy who he already knows drinks a lot, but he's from a good family. Family lines are important in the South, you know. And she's going to inherit a lot of land, but, you know, this scoundrel may gamble all her land away. And what? I need somebody who's going to be in there taking care of Precious. Now, you know, by taking care, I mean dressing Precious. She's an adult woman, fully intelligent, dressing Precious, uh, doing every little thing that Precious might want. I'm talking about enslaved people. And so if all else fail, that husband could squander his fortune and her land, but if she wanted to keep her slaves, she could keep her slaves. And Tennessee, sadly to say, we were lagging behind here in this field. Married women in Tennessee did not have the right to own their own property until 1913. Pretty unbelievable, isn't it? So here we've got women with virtually no rights. And uh, I got this little notion in my head, you know, folks, you know it is amazing what you can find out there on your computer if you just put your mind to it and have a little patience. 
So I went into the newspapers.com uh, subscription I have at home to the Nashville, Tennessee, and it includes the papers that were the forerunners of the Tennessee and all the way back to the 1830s. So what I was really trying to find out was what did the Tennesseans say about that meeting at Seneca Falls? Keep in mind, it was an anti-slavery meeting, and uh, we certainly in Tennessee were not talking, at least in Nashville and Middle Tennessee, we weren't talking about anti-slavery uh, activities in 1848 uh, in Tennessee. So what do you think? I, I couldn't find anything about Seneca Falls. So then I decided to put in women's rights and see what I could find, and bingo! Here I found this Nashville banner, uh, banner the Republican banner was the forerunner of the Tennessean, an article from 1853. And what they were covering on their uh, editorial page uh, was uh, an election in New York, and I don't know why people in Tennessee had any interest in an election in New York, but I think they were probably trying to fill their columns. And so in this article about uh, this election in New York and the Democrats that were running in this election, there, Nashville was overwhelmingly a Whig city. The business community of Nashville were Whigs, not Democrats, before the Civil War. And so here we've got this another ticket in New York. And look at the names on this ticket. We have got Lucy Stone, uh, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Amelia Bloomer. Guess what her fashion contribution to the world was? <laughs> yes, Bloomer. She thought that women's dresses confined us, and I, I agree with her. Those long dresses, uh, flowing gowns, that was certainly true. Uh, we've got none other than Susan B. Anthony, We've got a, and a Dutch woman for engineer. <laughs> they, they didn't have the decency to put her name if they knew her, so she was just a Dutch woman. But this was kind of what women's rights got published, the kind of women's rights things that got published in the newspapers across the South. I dare say Murfreesboro paper probably covered similar things like this that were going on in the wider world. They also covered a very comical story uh, in 1855 about some soldiers being sent out to Utah after Brigham Young's migration had gotten to Utah. They sent some soldiers out there to keep the peace. Uh, you know, the Mormons were persecuted very heavily, uh, and, and that's why they went out west in the first place. And so they had these soldiers there, and when the soldiers were ready to go to San Francisco, guess what? A bunch of Mormon women went off with them. And so they uh, were writing about this in the newspaper, and among the many things they said here in this article was, send those women's rights people out there. And so I thought that was very hilarious. Governor Young refers to Brigham Young here, but they wanted to send that bunch of women's rights people out there to teach those folks a few things. Uh, here you see the line, and we're going to send to this impending famine a corps of regularly disciplined women's rights women, women to lay down the law to their sisters among the Mormons. They, they were very disrespectful for the Mormons, but they were pretty disrespectful for women who wanted any kind of rights as well. It is really important to understand that the suffrage movement came out. It was birthed by the anti-slavery movement. And so all of these women were involved in anti-slavery movement, the anti-slavery movement before the Civil War. Now, it didn't really catch on in Tennessee for a long time. After the Civil War, we are caught up in Jim Crow politics. There were several efforts, really over in Memphis more so than in Middle or East Tennessee, to get some kind of a suffrage organization going uh, but they just couldn't quite get enough women committed to sustain the momentum for a suffrage uh, meeting. They, they were just simply not able to pull it off. There was a, a group here and a group there, but they just didn't last at all. The big Goliath of the women's movement in Tennessee, which was certainly acceptable, because the preachers endorsed this, and this was the Women's Christian Temperance Union. 
And it had over 250 chapters in our state with 95 counties. Uh, it got up to that size, and they were very powerful. They had a national convention in Nashville. You know where they had it, of course, the Ryman Auditorium. And uh, they, there was some talk about the WCTU endorsing women's suffrage. And the president of the Tennessee WCTU uh, issued a press release saying uh, that the Tennessee women did not support the Tennessee Chris, Women's Christian Temperance Union women did not support women's suffrage. Too radical for the state of Tennessee. But eventually it did catch on very slowly. You know, sometimes it's just kind of timing is everything and sometimes you plant seeds and they don't grow. And other times the seeds grow. And in particular with women, it's important to have women who can sustain any momentum that you might be able to generate. So here is one big point of information that I feel obliged to share with you. You know, people are asking me when I'm going to talk about those suffragettes, and sadly, that's not the word that American women ever used. All of their correspondence, they refer to themselves as suffragists not as suffragettes. The English women did in fact refer to themselves as suffragists, uh, suffragettes, but the American women, they were talking about equality, not a diminutive like the ETTE added to suffrage seemed to uh, give a connotation of. So finally, we have a suffragist organization in Tennessee growing. And Lyde Merriweather, who had uh, been very active in the uh, temperance movement, now gets active and interested in suffrage. And she is going to recruit another powerhouse of a woman, Lizzie Crozier French from Knoxville, who had, um, like so many of these women, including Carrie Chapman Catt, they were widows or they had no, not been married, but they didn't have young children at home to take care of. So she had gotten very interested in this movement. She was very interested in the Federation, uh, the General Federation of Women, and it was Lizzie Crozier French who masterminded uh, getting the women's uh, rights, property rights vote through the state legislature, the bill passed. Uh, she was the one that mobilized women to support that in 1913. Now, over in Memphis, we have Charles Orman William. She had been very concerned about public education because so many teachers were, in fact, women. And the fact of the matter was, female teachers in any public school would be paid only uh, about 50 to 75 percent of what a male teacher would be paid in a school. The reason was that these teachers were generally overwhelmingly widows or single and they had some man providing for them and a male teacher was the head of household and so the male teacher had more responsibility, thus can, uh, deserved more money. So Charles Orman Williams got very involved in getting Tennessee to make it legal to pass a law so that women could serve as school superintendents in Tennessee. That was a big step forward. You have men uh, controlling the schools, but the predominant people who are delivering the product, education, were all women. So you have her getting involved. Now, the, you have a couple of people who are w with women who have children, but they are elite white women who have lots of help at home. One of these beautiful women was Abby Crawford Milton. She was the second wife of George Fort Milton. Her husband uh, uh, was the editor and publisher of one of the newspapers in Chattanooga. She was interested in women having the right to vote and she got very interested in the suffrage association. Another one of these women who had children who was young and really quite lovely was Ann Dallas Dudley. Uh, Ann Dallas Dudley and, and all of these women in their own right 
are magnificent and really deserve a lot of credit. What I really uh, get bothered by is when people are going to talk about the suffrage movement in Tennessee and the only name they know is Ann Dallas Dudley. They don't know the names of any of these other women. And this is bothersome to me because women have always worked differently from the way men work. Women from the beginning saw a problem, formed a circle, and then they set about solving the problem. This is something that church women did. They felt the responsibility for uh, social services in Nashville. Well, in Tennessee, across Tennessee, there were no orphanages. And so in the 1830s and 40s, uh, what happened if your parents both die in some epidemic and you don't have relatives who can take care of you, you become a ward of the county court from where you live. Now, what was the job of the judge of the county court? He rented you out to somebody who needed some help. And you can see what the potential for uh, misuse of this is. It would be a family who uh, the mother was sick or she had died and left a man with young children that she couldn't take care of. It was a family that didn't have any children and had farm work to do and they needed a free set of hands. And so they rented these children out and these women said, this is just wrong for these kids. So they founded an orphan's asylum in Nashville. They did the same thing with women who were 18 years old and older but had no family and the only jobs of course they could get were essentially jobs on the street so they provided the house of industry for these women to live in. So women worked in circles and the suffrage movement was if nothing else it was a cooperative movement. It was not like a male dominated movement with a man at the top and then the, the, the majors underneath and the lieutenants and so on and so forth. This was a circular operation from the get go. And another thing that I think is really important to know about Tennessee is that Tennessee's movement was quite diverse. Now this is Catherine Talty Kenny. And uh, aside from the fact that she might have been older than Ann Dallas Dudley or uh, uh, Abby Crawford Milton, uh, you know, it seems like she's very well dressed and very well groomed so that she would have fit into that society. But Catherine Kenny was an Irish Catholic. She and her husband lived, had been born and lived and grew up in Chattanooga. Her parents sent her to a Catholic college up in Kentucky. Kentucky had a strong Catholic community. There's a, 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 a monastery up there today and she was sent to St. Catherine's College but when her father died she had to come home and take a job in Chattanooga to help her mother uh, make ends meet. So she married John Kenny who was another poor Irish kid but he had an opportunity because just about 1900, between 1900 and 1910, uh, some entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs in Chattanooga bought the bottling rights to bottle in Chattanooga a tasty beverage like yours. Is that one? Yes, it is. It looks like Coca-Cola, is it? Oh, it's root beer. Oh, excuse me. I might need to get my uh, glasses checked, don't I? Uh, but they, they bottled, Coke, they got a license to bottle Coca-Cola. Uh, and uh, they, it was really a license to print money. So they sold for a very nominal fee franchises to young men who wanted to get ahead to go out across the South and open the first Coca-Cola bottling company. So John Kenney's franchise was for Nashville. He comes to Nashville, he opens on Church Street a bottling concern, and he became very, very wealthy very quickly. And so, of course, you know, if you're operating your plant at full production, what are you going to start thinking? If I had more space, could produce more, I could make more money, right? Isn't that logical? If your business is booming, don't you want to expand? So guess what? 
He did this in about 1915. He borrowed money from a, 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 a family in Nashville that had a lot, they, they were, I wouldn't call them exactly a bank, but they made investments. This is what I guess you would call venture capital, except the business was already going. And then when the United States entered World War I in April of 1917, John Kenney could not pay the money back because sugar was being rationed and he couldn't operate his plant at full production. So he, he had a very sad life. But Catherine Kenney was uh, uh, the worker of one of the many women who worked in this. Uh, she was very, very active. She was a writer. She wrote all manner of things. She helped get it done. Sue Shelton White was uh, a, a stenographer and legal secretary in Jackson. She will later move to Washington, D.C., where she gets very involved with what was originally the Congressional Union that will become Alice Paul's Women's Party, National Woman's Party. Maria Thompson Davies, what an interesting person she was. She was an artist, she was a person who would be the 1915 equivalent of Danielle Steele. You know, she wrote romance novels and she cranked them out pretty quickly and they, they sold and she, so she was very close friends with Ann Dallas Dudley and uh, among other things, she published a book, uh, The Elected Mother, which is a little novella about a, 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 a woman who decides she wants the right to vote. So you've got women from all walks of life, and they get interested in this, and they are beginning to spread across the state. Now, I bet half of you don't know where Union County is. It's up there close to Knoxville, but it's sort of between Knoxville and the Kentucky border. It is a very poor little county, and yet they had women in Union County who wanted the right to vote. So by 1914, these Tennessee women really have a lot of momentum going. They've got energy, they're doing all sorts of interesting things, and they are really convinced that they are uh, getting things done here in Tennessee. So the National Suffrage Association says, we're going to let Tennessee host our national convention in November of 1914. Well, that sounds great, doesn't it? We're going to have this meeting. Where are we going to have it? Well, if you live in Nashville, where are you going to say, of course, the Ryman Auditorium. But there were some people, even in 1914, that were anywhere except Nashville, Tennessee. And so the Suffrage Association of Tennessee split over where the, where the National Convention was going to be. So the Memphis and Chattanooga women wanted it in Memphis, and they remained the Tennessee Equal Suffrage Association. And the other women, Abby Milton, even though she was from Chattanooga, Chattanooga Lizzie Crozier French, and the Nashville women said Nashville. So the convention was held in Nashville. Oh, that group that split off, they call themselves the Tennessee Equal Suffrage Association, comma, Inc. Now you'd think that this might have been the death knell for suffrage with these women fighting. But indeed, they campaigned so much, they talked so much about how wonderful this was going to be to solve all of society's program that the movement just blossomed and the convention was a big success. Can you imagine these women having this race? An airplane race with a car and an airplane. Now we're talking about 1914, folks, and so a lot of people went out to this open field somewhere in Davidson County and watched this uh, race between an airplane flown by a woman, I might add, and a, mo a late model overland racing car flown by another woman. I'm sure it was quite an occasion, and look, 50 cents, that's pretty pricey for admission to something, and these women were raising money. So the Nashville women begin having parades. They start parading from the state capitol down Church Street to the Parthenon. They put on these 
uh, outdoor dramas uh, on the steps of the Parthenon. They had all manner of speakers and activities and they were very popular and really stirred up a significant crowd. But then when the United States entered World War I, this is when the National Suffrage Association really began to divide. Alice Paul and those more active suffragists who wanted to really get out there and push Woodrow Wilson while we were in the war split off and, and from the other association and formed the National Woman's Party. And Carrie Chapman Catt by this time is the president of the National Association for Woman Suffrage, Woman Suffrage Association, and she said, we're going to support the war effort. And so this is when Alice Paul gets going, and women in Tennessee really support the war effort, but they are also working for the vote. Now, let me stop here a minute and just tell you, you've got some choices here. You don't have to amend the U.S. Constitution. One idea was to do it state by state. Now, who is that going to probably leave out? All southern states. Why? Because if white women can vote, black women could vote. And, you know, we've really worked hard to keep those black men from voting in the South, so we don't want this can of worms opened. So... Nobody really thought the South would ever ratify an amendment to the National Constitution or would do it by their states. So nobody ever thought that the, they thought the racial politics in the South were too intense to ever allow women to vote. So the Tennessee women had decided they were going to get the state constitution amendment. It, but those ex-Confederates, let me tell you, when they rewrote that constitution after the Civil War, they made it airtight because they were fixing that constitution so that they would never, ever lose power again. And so it was very complicated to amend it. So they would get it passed in one house, but not in the, the other house in the legislature. So finally, they gave up on that strategy and said, well, hey, what can we do without amending the state constitution? We can get the legislature to pass a bill. The governor will surely sign it if the legislature passes it to give women in Tennessee the right to vote in local elections and in national elections. But of course the legislature was saying, but in these elections that we're running in for the Tennessee General Assembly, women can't vote because that would have to require an amendment to the Constitution. So these women got very close in 1917, but in 1919 they were triumphant. They accomplished it. In April of 1919, the Tennessee General Assembly approved a suffrage for limited suffrage for Tennessee women, and they went to work. They were trying to get women registered to vote. Of course, to be registered to vote, you had to pay your poll tax. So Catherine Kenney and Ann Dallas Dudley and some of their friends with great fanfare went down to the courthouse, paid their poll tax, and voted very... Well, they were paid their poll tax to be ready to vote. Now, over in Camden, Tennessee... Anybody here from Camden? It's on the Tennessee River in West Tennessee. Uh, there was Mary Cordelia Hudson. She was living in Camden, and she got herself registered to vote, and they were having a special election the very next month after this passed. And so Mary Cordelia Beasley was the first woman in Tennessee to vote. Now, the, go the mayor of Camden uh, told this story after women had gotten the right to vote. He said, and I was the first man that the first woman voted for. He was very proud that she had voted for him for mayor of Camden, Tennessee. Here is Carrie Chapman Catt. Congress finally passes the amendment 
and it's now out to the states. Nobody thought about Tennessee. Nobody thought about any of the states in the Deep South. Let's just face it. But the Tennessee women have different ideas. We're up to 35 states. We don't know where 36 is coming from because all of the Deep South states that have voted have voted against ratification of this amendment. And these women from Tennessee have the audacity to say, we're going to do it. We're, we can pull it off. Now, this meeting of the first meeting of the League of Women Voters was remarkable in several aspects. The legislature had already adjourned, and so they were using the House chamber. And what is really remarkable is that Mrs. Kenney, the Irish Catholic, who was very involved in politics and very close friends with Luke Lee, who was the publisher of the Nashville Tennessean, Mrs. Kenney made a political deal with an African-American woman, Frankie Pierce. Frankie Pierce had an agenda, and you know what it was? She wanted the state to create a school for delinquent African-American girls. There was a school for delinquent African-American boys, but what, girls who, who broke the law uh, were sent to the women's prison. And so she had this agenda. And she goes in and speaks before this white audience. She and Maddie Coleman, who had a degree from Fisk, uh, and Meharry, and a, a dental degree as well as a medical degree, uh, they registered African Americans to vote. And she got up and she talked about what will we do with the vote? We will use it to uplift our people by any stretch of the imagination, it was a remarkable thing that she said. So they convince our governor, who's running for re-election, to call the special session. He says he'll do it right after he wins the Democratic primary in August. So true to his word, he calls the special session. And into town comes, Car Catherine, uh, Car uh, comes Carrie Chapman Catt, she can't stay away. She wants to be part of the action. She checks into the Hermitage Hotel, which was really the very nicest hotel in Nashville at the time. It had just been finished about 10 years. And the very next day after Mrs. Cat checked into the Hermitage, who else should get off the train but Miss Josephine Pearson. She was going to be the head of the Anti-Rejection League in Tennessee to save Southern womanhood from the vote. So she checks into the Hermitage Hotel. There are parties all over the place. The women's party have to use a cheaper hotel. They didn't have much money. They were at the Tulane, but they all start working on the men who are gonna come and be the ones to vote in this special session. So the session finally is going to begin on August the 9th, 1920. Now the Antis, they have pulled out all the stops. They are waving the race card as highly as they can. But I got to say, the suffragists did the same thing. Even Alice Paul said, you know, this is, we're talking about white women, you southern states have already taken all the voting rights away from African American men, African American women won't be voting. They all sadly played the race card. So here is one of the cartoons that was in the paper. You've got the suffragists and you've got an old confederate there not knowing which way to go with the suffragists or the antis. And here is the Antis headquarters, the Anti-Ratification League, and they have what they call a museum exhibit in the lobby of the Hermitage Hotel to explain and show to people why women should not be allowed to vote. And so, among things, they have pictures of Susan B. Anthony, the African-American man that... Uh, conservative Southerners hated the most 
was W.E.B. Du Bois. He'd been educated at Fisk, mind you, but they hated him because unlike Booker T. Washington, who said, let's just do the best we can, accommodation, W.E.B. Du Bois said, don't let your rights be taken away from you. Stand for complete equality. So they have a picture of Susan B. Anthony and W.E.B. Du Bois. Well, that really got Southerners all upset. They've got all manner of lists of things that are going to happen if women get the right to vote. I mean, children are going to be neglected at home because their mothers are out voting all the time. I mean, men probably won't get their supper on time. I mean, look at this. The poor old rooster's having to do whatever you do with those eggs because he has no clue. And Mama has gone out the hen with her voting sash on because Mama hen is going to vote. And then it gets worse. This is a big poster in the museum exhibit of the Antis. And there's Francis Willard in the middle of it. So the Antis pulled out all the stops. They did everything they could to prevent it. And it finally gets down to the Tennessee House. The Senate ratified it on August 13th by a pretty comfortable margin. But in the House, it was rumored that votes were being bought and these men who had been in favor of suffrage, including the entire Davidson County delegation to the General Assembly, had switched from yellow roses supporting suffrage to red roses, uh, which meant they were against the amendment. And so we've got really two votes. Now, I would imagine that pretty much everybody in here knows about Harry Byrne and his mama's letter in his pocket. But what you don't know probably is the name of Banks Turner. He was from Yorksville, Tennessee. He was a representative. And they brought up a vote to just table the amendment in the House. In other words, we're not going to vote, so your record will not be tarnished. We're just going to vote to put it aside until next year. And Banks Turner changed his vote and voted against tabling it. And had Banks Turner not ever changed his vote, Harry Byrne would have never gotten the chance to vote in the first place. So you know the rest of the story. Harry Byrne, who's wearing a red rose that morning in the state capitol, had gotten a letter from his mama in Nyota, and it was, you know, look, I want you to look at this envelope that she sent. This is up at UT in the McClung Library there. Uh, to the Honorable H.T. Byrne, Nashville, Tennessee, State Capitol. And so that morning when he came into the Capitol, somebody brings him this letter from his mama who lives in East Tennessee in Nyota. And, I mean, it's the newsy. It's, you know, Aunt so-and-so's had the croup and the rheumatism is bothering Uncle so-and-so and your cousin did this and that and the other. And it's eight pages written in pencil. But then it gets over here towards page seven and eight. Hurrah and vote for suffrage. Don't keep them in doubt. I noticed some of the speeches against. They were bitter. I have been watching to see how you stood but have not noticed anything yet. Be a, don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat put the rat in ratification. So eventually the reporters caught up with him. Harry changed his vote and so the vote instead of 48 to 48 was going to be 49 to 47, then somebody else changed their vote, and it was 50 to 46. We won, we won, we won. And, you know, one of the myths about all of this is the antis chasing Harry and him hiding. He did uh, hide for a little while, but the antis, there was total pandemonium. You know, these women up in the balcony are crying. They're hugging each other. Rose petals are flying. The antis are furious. And when they finally caught up with Harry, uh, Harry is the one, this is Harry Byrne, this is Banks Turner. They finally caught up with Harry and he showed them that letter from his mama back in Nyota, Tennessee. 
that had convinced him that he needed to do the right thing. And he had made up his mind, he said, that if the election was close and his vote mattered, he would vote uh, for the amendment. But if it was going to win by a large margin or lose by a large margin, he would not cast a vote. And so Harry became the hero of the hour. The Antis tried to get it re, uh, brought back up to be voted on, but the vote stood. And women across the country were going to get the right to vote. There's Mrs. Cat when she arrived in Washington. Uh, the Antis tried to hold a meeting. They couldn't do anything to get the thing overturned. And women got the right to vote in Tennessee. Now, in closing, any of you know Bess Gordon Bailey? Is she in your history books? No, she's not. She was a farmer's wife in the middle of nowhere out in Texas. She was my grandmother. In 1920, she was 40 years old. She and my grandfather had been married uh, for five years. They got married when she was 35 and he was 50. Uh, they had one child. That was my mother, Maggie. And uh, Maggie was four years old in 1920. And out there in the middle of nowhere, my grandmother took her daughter and went to vote. And for these women, this was precious. This right was sacred. They always voted. My grandmother loved politics. And you all have probably never seen these big old boxy black and white TVs that we used to have, big chunks of furniture. But my grandmother would sit there and watch those political conventions uh, all morning, noon, and night. She loved the spectacle of it all. She was highly intrigued about it. And so here is my grandmother getting to vote because of something that happened, what, 25 miles as the crow flies from here to the Tennessee capital? And yet, for the longest time, this story was just forgotten. Well, that's not real history. It's just women's history. And so Carrie Chapman Catt said it best. The vote is the emblem of our equality. Women of America, the guarantee of your liberty, that vote of yours has cost millions of dollars and the lives of thousands of women. Women have suffered agony of soul which you never can comprehend that you and your daughters might inherit political freedom. The vote has been costly. Priv prize it. The vote is a power, a weapon of offense and defense. It is a prayer. Use it intelligently, conscientiously, prayerfully. Progress is calling you to make no pause. And so, in closing, I give you the charge that she gave those women in 1920. Act. Thank you very much. I'd love to hear, if you have any stories from your families, I'd love to hear them. Or if you have any comments or questions. I uh, am always entertained uh, when people ask questions that I've never thought about. So I love to talk to students. And so let me know if you have any questions. Uh, anybody have a question before people start uh, leaving here? Comments? Anybody know about the first woman in your family that voted? Well, go find the oldest person in your family and ask them. If it's your granny, ask your granny. If it's your great-grandmother, ask her. But find out. It is a fabulous story. And we're going to have a big party next year in 1920. I mean 1920, 2020. <laughs> a time machine. I'm taking you all back to that day. Oh, there will be no cell phones. Women will have to be using an iron. There will be no polyester clothing. How will we survive? Yes, Dr. Evans. So we always hear this a lot, that some people support uh, programs or issues that are counter to their own well-being. Yes. How is it even possible that there were women who would have been opposed to women's vote? 
Uh, that is kind of an oxymoron, I guess you might say. Why would women oppose women voting? Why would women oppose women having equal rights? It is completely beyond me to understand that. I think a lot of it has to do with tradition and breaking tradition. There are a lot of religious mores, as you know as well as I do. Uh, the Bible is open to interpretation, and some people take parts of the Bible and say uh, women are not equal to men, and other people take it and say, oh, yes, they are. Some people take the scripture out of context and say the Bible and Jesus uh, uh, supported slavery. Other people say, oh, absolutely not. Jesus preached brotherly love. So there's lots and lots of reasons why people are afraid of equality. But somebody told me something when I was uh, getting ready to get married. I had been teaching school in Atlanta for a while. I didn't get married uh, right after I got out of college, and I'd been teaching school, and, and somebody said, uh, and this was a man who said this. Uh, he said, so you're, you're giving up your freedom, and you're just going to be a kept wife. Well, uh, that's, you know, you're only one man, ladies, or for that matter, you men. If you want to be a kept husband, fine, but you are only one man, ladies, opposed from total destitution. And so you need to have finished your education. You need to have a, 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 a means of supporting yourself. And so if you all are going to all inherit a big bucket of money, I guess you'll have a trust fund as long as the stock market doesn't go belly up. But very few people, I don't know anybody that has a trust fund, frankly. So, uh, you know, I don't count on your family's inheritance supporting you. But it's, it, listen, this is going to be so much fun this year. There's so much going on. And, you know, get things rolled in here at, at MTSU. Uh, because it's got to happen in the spring because by the time you all come back in the fall, it's going to be over. The party's going to be over. So plan some things in the spring. There's lots of, lots of opportunities and things to celebrate. Be sure you're registered to vote. Oh, yes, get registered to vote. They're, 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 we're, we're trying to get people to get the legislature to pass a bill so that college students can vote on the college campuses rather than absentee. I support that. I support that. All right, y'all have a great day. It looks like maybe I see a little hint of sunshine out there finally today. Enjoy yourselves.